Welcome to day one of Bitwise, where we build the complete software and hardware stack for a computer from scratch. Uh, for those of you who watched yesterday's stream, where we uh, did an overview of, of what the project is about and what you can expect from it, um, today we'll be uh, taking a slightly more directed technical uh, tack and, and dive right into some technical design overviews. Uh, I do, before we get to that, I do want to quickly follow up on yesterday's stream. Uh, responding to some, some sources of confusion that I saw. When I listed the, 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 the weekday, you know, Monday to Friday uh, uh, time slots and so on, I, I didn't really take into account that there's a time zone difference between those time zones. And so what for me and for Europe would be considered uh, Monday is actually Sunday for the US. And so I'll have to figure out a way to write that in a more, uh, less confusing way. Um, but um, if you missed out on yesterday's stream because you were confused by that off by one bug, um, you know, we have the day zero appropriately named, I think in this case, uh, day zero stream archived on YouTube. And the plan is in the future, including right after uh, I finish this stream, I will immediately up you to YouTube. And then I will add a link just like this one in the stock. Um, and so hopefully over time, as we get further along, you'll always be able to sort of do a quick grep to find a stream that you're trying to look up, click the link and just watch it. So this will sort of be a self-contained overview of, of all that stuff. Um, and I also committed this to the GitHub repository so you can go and look at this now if you want to. All right, so uh, diving right in. Um, if you read the overview and I will bring it up, um, if you look at the roadmap, You'll, you'll see, you know, a bunch of stuff. And uh, let's see, where do I talk about the host site tooling? Okay, here it is. Um, when I had to decide what order to do things in, I was kind of torn between two different approaches. One was to dive right in with hardware stuff, uh, basically from day one, because I considered that probably to be the most compelling uh, proposition of the whole project for software people who are maybe not as familiar with that. Um, on the other hand, in order to do useful hardware development, we will need things like assemblers, disassemblers, debuggers, emulators, and just various tools of that sort. And the question is, what do we write those in? Now, C is obviously a good language for that, pretty good language. Uh, certainly, I would be happy to write it in that. But um, my thought was we'll need to do a systems programming language eventually. And if we scope it correctly and make the right choices about what to do in the implementation and the design, then we can spend the first few weeks kind of front loading uh, at least the first major pass on that language and compiler. And then after that, we will move into, um, you know, writing like an emulator, uh, assembler, disassembler, et cetera, in that language. And that way, um, all the code we write after the initial compiler will essentially be under our own control. And in particular, even though initially uh, the code will run on the host machine, so your, you know, your Linux, Mac, or uh, Windows machine, um, once we bring up the hardware, it will be able to run on there as well. And we'll actually be able to take all the assembler, you know, all the systems tools we built to bootstrap and deploy them on the hardware so we can run the assembler and the compiler uh, on the system itself, rather than just having a pure cross-compilation workflow. So that was sort of trying to structure the dependency graph. I figured as long as this initial phase of compiler development is kept fairly succinct, uh, I think this is the right order. Um, a side benefit is that even though uh, a bunch of software people probably do have a good grasp on compiler development, it's kind of a standard topic in CS uh, degree courses. I I, I do think that there's a lot of practical know-how that people miss out on because of kind of an academic bias in the topics usually covered in those courses. And so I do think that it's actually a good kind of proof by example of our overall philosophy to look at how we'll be developing that compiler, um, sharing some specific techniques for, you know, uh, parsing by hand with recursive descent for LL1 languages, um, how to structure your program, it, when you're writing kind of straightforward C code in case maybe people are coming from C++ or other higher level languages. And so sort of based on all those considerations, I decided, hey, let's just do 
as a kickoff uh, before we get into the hardware, let's actually do the systems language first. Um, I anticipate it will take something like two to three weeks to finish uh, phase one. And we might actually start writing some of the hardware related tools before the language is, you know, before we kind of have a milestone where we say we're going to put down language development for a bit. Because, you know, those, those tools we have to develop will be good uh, exercises for testing the language implementation to make sure that it's working. So anyway, uh, hopefully that, um, that makes sense. So with that out of the way, I want to actually move into uh, my main topic for today, which is really motivating the systems language and the choices I made and how we'll be proceeding with it. Um, and this is not me making an arbitrary set of decisions up front and then trying to justify them post hoc. Uh, this is really a reflection of my own thinking as I came to some of these conclusions. So hopefully uh, it won't seem like I'm just kind of railroading you into seeing my point of view, but it will actually be a compelling argument. So I'm gonna open up this uh, doc where I kind of have uh, an outline of, of what I consider essential. So um, the language we'll be building I've called ION, uh, a C-like systems programming language. Um, incidentally, I think someone brought this up yesterday, there are actually a few other programming languages called ION. Only one of them is in active development and my original version of ION predates that project by at least six months. So I feel given that there's not much overlap, it's a systems language versus a JavaScript uh, extension language or something like that. Uh, I, I, I felt like it was fair to use this name. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the goals for the language uh, is, you know, just sort of abstracting uh, from the conclusions, but just kind of thinking of it at a high level, specifically for our purposes, not for general systems programming, but for our purposes specifically, it has to be easy to implement. You know, if you're just a user of a language, you might not care how easy it is to implement a compiler, but we're going to have to implement the compiler ourselves. So this is actually, you know, maybe not number one, but I do think putting a number one in the list uh, is appropriate, even if, you know, you wouldn't want to make it so simple and implement that the language is useless. Nevertheless, this is a, going to be an overriding constraint for us. It has to be easy to implement with simple techniques. Not, we, we shouldn't have to use advanced techniques to do a good compiler for it. The second constraint is that it should be immediately familiar to C programmers with no learning curve, essentially. And this um, this constraint is self-imposed, but I think that the natural audience for Bitwise are going to be people who are very comfortable and, and fluent in C. And so if we're going to not use C, uh, then certainly I want it to be like a drop-in fit for anyone who's used to C. I don't want to make needless changes in things like keywords and syntax unless there's a really compelling reason motivated by other constraints. Um, third, uh, and this is where you know C might not be a great fit. Uh, reducing distractions and needless features is a big motivation. So this is not a sort of kitchen sink, put all the features in it language. Uh, we want to keep it simple to implement, simple to understand. When we're programming, we don't want to have to think about all kinds of different features that might be used to accomplish our goal. Uh, we want to have a fairly minimal set of, of, of tools that are generally effective for solving problems in our domain of systems programming. Um, it has to be comfortable for day-to-day -day work because we'll actually be dogfooding it. So this is not a, uh, a toy language for a comp compiler course in college where you only ever write test programs. And so you don't really care about how comfortable it is as a language design or how effective it is as a language implementation. Uh, we'll be using it ourselves. And so if we take needless shortcuts and screw things up in the name of expediency, we'll be paying for it later. So it has to be comfortable. It has to be, has, has good usability and practice. And finally, um, I mentioned this briefly before, it has to be useful, usable for host development. In other words, Windows, Linux, Macs, x86, x64 development and target development on the RISC-V core that we'll be designing. Um, and so that's kind of an, uh, a constraint that actually has a bunch of implications. So for example, on the host, in, in my opinion, for a systems language like this to be very useful uh, for, on a host, like you're on a Windows machine or a Linux machine, you need completely seamless interop with C and the host OS. Um, however, the target constraints are actually rather different. We obviously have to generate machine code because we're bootstrapping this uh, software stack on the target from nothing. But on the target, we actually don't need C compatibility. Like we don't need compatibility with other C libraries because we're going to be writing everything ourselves. So those are two 
uh, actually different constraints. Um, the final one is something I actually spend a lot of time thinking on. Um, anytime someone talks about making a new programming language, I think a serious question should be, all right, even assuming that language is, um, is really great by whatever metrics you care about, um, what, what if you go and write 100,000 lines of code, which is probably the same order of magnitude of code we'll be eventually writing, and like what happens to that code afterwards? Suppose you wrote a bunch of really good reusable code that you'd like to use in the future. Uh, what happens to that code? Is it just stuck in this black hole closed ecosystem, um, which is like, uh, you know, like a closed system? And um, that's an issue that a lot of things that um, take simplicity as a completely overriding constraint, uh, I think, violate. And whether it's important, again, depends on how much you weight the ability to kind of recover your code from the language and, and deploy it and, and to continue developing it elsewhere. But if you look at something, for example, like, uh, you know, Viet's, um, Viet's Oberon language, it's a very clean, minimalistic language. It satisfies some of our other constraints. Um, but if you go and write a bunch of code in it, um, you know, you're going to have a hard time interoperating with C libraries without a bunch of, of boilerplate interop. Um, and, you know, so I, I feel like that's actually a constraint that almost no existing languages really treat very seriously. Um, and especially for a language like ours, which is not going to be like a big product, long-term product, uh, open source project or something like that. Uh, I think this is actually a very uh, necessary constraint. You have to you have to answer the question of how do you protect that long term code investment if you're going to be using a non C language for systems programming. But I also want to emphasize some non goals because based on people's uh, questions to me about this, I know there's already some misconceptions about what what they assume I'm trying to accomplish. Uh, the absolutely top non goal is we don't we're not trying to design the quote unquote best language ever, which is what a lot of people fall into when doing language design. And I'm not even taking a stance on whether that's a good idea or not. I'm just saying that for our purposes, that's definitely the wrong approach. Another non-goal is to be highly opinionated versus C. And what I mean is, if you have a lot of idiosyncratic opinions about what C did wrong, uh, and you really want to fix them because you're very attached to kind of your your alternative, um, that's even if I feel that way, I'm not going to impose it on the language design because again, going back to one of the goals, I want it to be immediately familiar to C programmers. So even trivial stuff like changing uh, the struct keyword to type or something like that or record is needless, you know, it's kind of a, a needless change that doesn't really add anything. Like it may have aesthetic value to you personally, but it's just one more stumbling block uh, and disconnect between C and the language, which in uh, which in our context isn't really adding any value. Another non-goal is raising the level of abstraction. So if you look at a language like Go and Swift, um, in addition to you know, improving on C in various ways, um, they also add a ton of higher level abstractions. So you know, Go has garbage collection uh, and it has a Go routine concurrency and stuff like that. Uh, Swift has all the Objective-C features in addition to new features. So that's explicitly not our goal. Uh, we're, we're aiming for a language that's at exactly the same level of abstraction as C, neither lower level nor higher level, pretty much exactly a match for that same level of abstraction. And I guess what, what is kind of a corollary, but not really, I think safety is actually a separate issue. Uh, we're not aiming to solve the memory and integer overflow safety problem. It's a very serious problem for security and, and also just for, you know, non, what you might call non-security correctness. Um, and, you know, it's great that languages like Rust are trying to solve those problems in a um, systems programming context, but that's explicitly not a goal for us. Um, we're, we're really not trying to kind of fundamentally reconceptualize C when it comes to those sorts of things. So, uh, so next, like given everything I said, why wouldn't we just use C? Well, uh, or rather, why would you use C given these constraints? Like, why might you consider using C? Well, first off, it's the appropriate level of abstraction. That's maybe a little circular since we're defining this relative to C, but uh, for the target audience it's in the target problem space, it's an appropriate level of abstraction. It's familiar to the target audience. A very big one is that the ecosystem uh, of, you know, people who know the language, libraries written in it, and really high quality tool chains um, is 
you know, has immense value and is something we wouldn't have to write ourselves well, kind of. Um, because if the goal is to write a compiler from scratch rather than just using an existing C compiler, then we would actually have to write at least the tool chain from scratch. Maybe then we'd be able to leverage the libraries and the rest of the ecosystem, but at least the tool chain we would have to write from scratch. Um, and to go back earlier, the code is a protected investment. I think of all languages I can think of, uh, a reusable library written in C probably has the most long-term, like it's not a depreciating asset, it will probably be usable 30 years from now on every platform. Uh, every scripting language nowadays has really good uh, FFI, C interop, you know, Python has C types and C FFI. LuaJIT has an amazing uh, FFI that can directly parse C declarations and generate type metadata. So if you write a plain C library with, you know, with some level of reusability in mind, you basically have a like an asset for life, right? Like it's not going to lose its value uh, and in addition, not just as a library to link against, but as a library to further develop, you know, C will always be around. There will always be people who know C and uh, the tools will be around. I mean, when I say forever, I mean f for the time horizon that I'm capable of considering. So those are, I think, all very compelling reasons to use C. Um, however, why wouldn't you use C? Well, for our purposes, going back to goal number one about uh, ease of implementation, uh, C compilers have a lot of needless compiler complexity owing to kind of random quirks of the language that are not really essential. Um, and the language design itself has distracting gotchas. Like, I mean, I talk about a bunch of them below, so we will go into more detail. And you, you might sort of, you know, say that a bunch of this is legacy cruft. Uh, I love C, but there's stuff like that that you have to get used to. Uh, it adds complexity. Uh, both, sorry, both for programmers and for compilers, and uh, given everything else, it's worth kind of simplifying and fixing. Um, and sort of as an extension of, of number one here, it's challenging to build non-compiler tooling. I'm sure you've noticed that uh, while there are high quality C compilers, basically until uh, Clang came along, there were very few high quality sort of C tools for things like refactoring uh, or static analysis. And the reason is that existing, it was very hard to just write a tool. Like you, you, if you wanted to parse C completely, you needed to have a fairly complete model of C. You couldn't just parse it. You needed to know the symbol table to know what names refer to types versus variables and stuff like that. So as a result, C has always sort of, I would say either lagged or straight up suffered from the complexity of implementing even something like a parser that can actually resolve um, uh, every kind of syntactic production correctly. Um, so yeah, parsing requires a symbol table, um, uh, unbounded, and there's unbounded look ahead in some cases um, as well, uh, or large slash unbounded look ahead, which you know adds complexity to a compiler and um, is is actually completely unnecessary if you design from this from scratch to avoid it. Um, one particular syntactic uh, nightmare in C I think everyone knows about is the type designator syntax is way too complex, both for humans and for compilers. Uh, I mean, compilers, once you've written them, obviously will handle them just fine, but writing, writing a parser for them is actually quite quite tricky, um, relatively speaking to, to how easy it should be, in my opinion. Um, and the the other i mean the the way you see this is people have to use type defs uh, you know intermediate type defs in order to construct complex types which i mean that might be a good idea anyway but the language syntax shouldn't be so complex that you're forced into doing stuff like that just to write down uh, types um, another quirk that i'm sure everyone knows about it has a completely broken precedence table i think it has 15 precedence levels um, famously stuff like this uh doesn't doesn't do what you want because this is interpreted as this because of the precedence of of bitwise and is actually higher than the comparison operator so and it just has too many precedence levels in addition to that but also just the precedence is is broken um and you know this is just something that you would want to fix if you're revisiting the syntax but uh it's certainly a a serious blemish on the the syntax um, another major source that's more semantic, uh, major source of problems that's more semantic, is the prevalence of implicit arithmetic conversions and integer promotions, um, where you know there, there's a whole sort of rank system for promoting types. Um, famously, if you try to do a signed versus unsigned comparison of an int versus a uint, 
you will get a that's notoriously error prone and all compilers emit a warning for it. Um, and so there's a lot of, of, of these sort of traps that are due to implicit conversions and trying to promote everything to certain types automatically. And um, I think kind of with the benefit of hindsight, people have realized that um, what C does in this respect is, is, is too excessive and um, you know, essentially all subsequent uh, C-like languages have, have, have chosen to mitigate that in some way. Another thing is that there's a serious overuse of casts instead of explicit non-cast conversions and construction. So C++ actually addressed this by, you know, rather than writing int x uh, or, or say you have an uh, n64, I guess let's call it u64, you, ha you have to do something like this or you can just do it totally implicitly in, in C. Um, but this same syntax is also used for stuff like, you know, uh, casting away, you know, suppose you have, uh, was it const void p, and uh, you want to do this. So the, the syntax, uh, the same syntax is also used for, for quite semantically different things like casting away constness and casting, you know, between pointer types. And while you want to have uh, that kind of low level bit casting be readily available in a systems language, um, you definitely want to have the ability to just do something like this where it doesn't have cast semantics, it catches bugs when you're just trying to do construction of a value, uh, but still have this other stuff available. And so C fixes this in one sense, but then it makes it worse because it relegated all the kind of old school um, style of C casting to, you know, const cast and reinterpret cast, which is so ugly that no systems programmers I know uh, use them willingly. And so by making those um, sort of safe alternatives, if you will, or more explicit alternatives, so ugly and inconvenient to use, C prog uh, most programmers programming in C++ who need to do low level casting actually just end up using C style casts anyway, which kind of brings back some of the problems where the casts are too powerful, it, the compiler doesn't really help you catch bugs. So anyway, that seems to me like one thing you would want to fix, uh, even in a low level systems language. Another thing is that there's a huge uh, over reliance on the CP processor for uh, managing, you know, multiple translation units. Um, partly as a result of there being absolutely no way of packaging stuff. Uh, I don't necessarily mean namespacing, by the way, with mod when I say packages and modules, although that is sort of something you can add to it. But I just mean a way of organizing code where you don't have to um, rely on textual inclusion as your basic way of combining different units. Uh, and all of this leads to physical coupling, which means that parsing tends to be slower um, and, and, and things like that. Uh, and, and finally, this is, I think, notorious, <clears throat> is that undefined behavior is everywhere. You know, very notably signed overflow, illegal aliasing. Um, if you shift by, by, a bit, by a shift amount that's wider than the, uh, the bit width of the operand, then you have undefined behavior and so on. Um, so those are all reasons why you would not use C given our constraints. Um, so what's my proposed resolution? Well, in order to have essentially perfect interoperability and so on, let's use the C type system and the machine model. And on the various platforms where we need to interoperate with C, let's use the, the platform ABIs. Um, and to simplify the compiler and uh, hopefully also uh, simplify the programmer's mental model, we're going to use a simple C-like syntax. It's going to be LL1 parsable and it will be completely independent of simple table information. Um, after going through this design exercise gradually over several months, this is something I did quite a while ago, I ended up actually converging to similar changes to the C language that the Go and Swift designers made. But um, despite certain superficial similarities, I want to make it clear that unlike those two languages, we are unabashedly low level. So there's no runtime, there's no GC, there's no fancy features, no OO. Um, no huge standard library, stuff like that. It's, um, it's very C-like in its level of abstraction, um, but some of the surface syntax and surface semantics has been cleaned up uh, to, you know, in a way that happens to, to harmonize uh, quite well with what Go and Swift ended up doing. So what do we do on the back end? Well, remember for the target, we really need to emit machine code directly. And so we will have a target back end for RISC-V. Uh, and that will be a, a, like a real machine code emitting backend. Uh, and probably we'll start with a simple Viet style one pass code gen approach for doing that. And maybe later we'll do more optimization, but that's 
uh, what I think is sort of the shortest path from A to B for solving this problem. And then the thing that might be, um, I guess, unusual to some people is that on the host, meaning your Windows machine, your Linux or Mac machine, the back end is not going to try to emit native code. Instead, we're going to emit C code that is isomorphic, meaning has the same shape. We're not going to uh, you know, reduce the, the source language to some very atomized intermediate language and then turn that into C code the way, for example, the old LLVM C backend did. It's going to be completely isomorphic to the original source code, and it's going to be idiomatic as a result. Because by trying to harmonize the source language syntactically and semantically with C and having this backend that preserves the shape and the idioms of the code, we will actually be able to generate C code, which is, you know, it will look like almost a search and replace, except for certain features, but it will look uh, almost like a mirror copy of our code. And I want to emphasize, since I know some, some newbie compiler programmers uh, take an approach where they will do stuff like this, and it will be a very superficial, you know, regex style string replacement approach. But I want to emphasize that this will be a real backend. It will be fully decoupled from the front end. Um, it will essentially just be a drop-in replacement for the machine code, the machine code backend. Um, and so it's a real backend. This is not really cheating. I mean, it gives us a bunch of leverage, but it's not just doing superficial string matching. It's a real compiler with a real backend. Um, and so what, what's good about this, uh, this, the C approach, the C code generation approach? Well, it's extremely easy to bootstrap because we have C tool chain on our system. Uh, if the generated code looks wrong, we can use our knowledge of C to easily spot that at a glance. Um, we get automatic interoperability because C has great interoperability with other C libraries because it's C. Um, and it will be highly portable. Uh, really, the main platform specific thing we need to add on top of C itself is in order to resolve um, uh, certain constant expressions that are part of types, like for example, if you have, um, if you have an array um, and you do something like this, then you need to be able to know the size of T when you're resolving types. And so, I mean, there, and there are other more complex reasons, but basically uh, this forces the front end to be aware of some data parameters that characterize the back end target beyond it just being C. So we need to know the size of primitive types uh, that constitute the standard ABI. We need to know about alignment and packing and stuff like that. But aside from that, it's basically portable C code. Um, and the great thing is that when we emit, you know, the, in the example I just made, when we emit the equivalent code, when we emit the equivalent code, even though we have to resolve this stuff ourselves to, for example, suppose T is is uh, in 32, this would be equivalent to um, to four. Um, even though we have to resolve these uh, constant expressions based on backend info ourselves in the front end. Once we actually emit the corresponding C code, it's going to be equivalent to this. So in other words, it's not going to have sort of macro expanded the size of in the front end. It will preserve the entire syntactic structure, including stuff like constant expressions that use size of and other target dependent things. So anyway, um, that's really the main the main thing that infects the front end from the back end is we need to know some basic stuff about type layout and memory and packing and stuff like that. Um, the huge thing, of course, is if we do this, we get the tool chain for free. Uh, that includes the compiler, most obviously, but also all the OS, all the tooling around a compiler. So if you want to use the Visual Studio Debugger on Windows or GDB on Linux or Mac or whatever, including via IDEs, um, you, what you have is just C code, so you can just use it from day one. You have a real, uh, you know, world-class debugger, uh, for example, that you can use to debug your own code. Um, and one particular um, case where that's, I think, uh, extremely important is on Windows, because to generate good debug info for profilers and debuggers and so on, you need to generate PDB files. And even Clang, which has recently gotten much better PDB support still doesn't generate as clean PDB info as MSVC. So it's completely hopeless for us to undertake the task of doing a good Windows backend, for example. And, and on and Linux, we would also have to generate dwarf uh, debug info and all this other stuff. All of that is a ton of complexity. In other words, it's not just a case of generating the machine code that's, for simple compilers, actually easier than generating 
the debug info, if you can believe it. So, uh, but by doing this, yeah, we get all the, we get the full tool, cha tool chain support for free from day one. And one thing that really supports this is the pound line directive. Um, the C preprocessor communicates with the C compiler by after um, preprocessing, um, you know, the, the input source files and doing all the pound include expansion and other forms of macro expansion. Um, in order for the C compiler to know where all the expanded code originally came from, it has pound line directives, which say, you know, th this line in the uh, preprocessed source comes from this file and this line. And all of that data makes it into the debug info. And hence, when you're in the debugger, um, because of this, we'll actually be able to single step, not through the generated C code in terms of what we're seeing in the text editor as we're stepping, but our own language code. So it will basically seem as if we have a custom debugger just for our language. Um, this is really kind of obvious in hindsight, but um, if you're someone who's a big fan of, you know, kind of using a debugger heavily for development and having profilers that you can easily use early on and so on. This is really uh, an impossible to underestimate benefit. Um, and as I said, it generates idiomatic C code, but also idiomatic C packages. So you can take a collection of source files in our language and generate and package it up as a C library. And as I'll talk about later, this includes, for example, taking a multi-file code base and packaging it up as a, an SDB style single file header only library, doing any appropriate name uh, renaming of identifiers to avoid collisions and so on without having to manage all that naming and renaming in the source file. So it lets you generate you know, idiomatic high quality C libraries and, it, and through that it protects the code investment uh, that, that we've made by once we've written a lot of code in this language. We, we, we have the C code in library form and in addition, because the C code it generates is sort of isomorphic and idiomatic, suppose you decide at some point after having written 10,000 lines of code in our language that actually you just want to move back to C and continue development. Well, you can just convert it once, delete the old code, and only work on the C code. And because the C code isn't some gnarly, uh, low-level, flattened, assembly-like language thing that happens to be expressed in C, but actually high-level idiomatic code, you can continue developing it in C and just leave behind the ion language, like you know, no hard feelings, no foul, no no no, no uh, harm. So, I think that's a very important benefit for what we're doing, and hopefully, it eases some people's worry that if they spend a lot of time working in ion, it's just kind of a dead end that they won't be able to apply elsewhere. Um, the one downside of using C in this way is that it pretty much leaves us stuck with the standard litany of undefined behavior in C. Um, we could, by introducing additional translation, unidiomatic un translation, we could actually remove some of this stuff. Um, but I think that's actually the, the wrong trade-off for what we're doing. So we will have to be at least somewhat conscious of undefined behavior um, from, from C. Um, but for the most part, just like when we're programming in C, honestly, most people aren't too concerned with undefined behavior. It does matter. Uh, but uh, we, we will take a similar approach when programming in ION. Um, and so beyond these basic uh, kind of decisions, there's a bunch of other quality of life stuff that you might say go, goes beyond the bare minimum of what you, could, of what you might do given these resolutions. Um, so for example, um, as, as you'll see in a bit, I, I plan to do a simple two-pass compiler uh, with a decoupled AST in the front end and a you know, type resolving code generating back end. And one nice benefit of that is it's very easy to do order independent declarations so that you don't have to do fork declarations of functions, for example, which is, I mean, it's a small quality of life benefit. It, it actually helps a lot when you're refactoring uh, what files define what functions, uh, having to always figure out, you know, what forward declarations to add or delete as you move code around both in the same file in the order and also between different files. Um, that's kind of a nightmare and order independent declarations, which is kind of the standard for all modern languages. Um, it, you get that pretty much for free with a little bit of work if you already have a two-pass compiler. Um, and another thing that's easy to do and I think is super useful for a, a systems language is you do you want to support runtime introspection where the compiler at compile time can express its understanding of things like type layout in memory and can actually uh, reify it as a runtime descriptor that the runtime code that you write or libraries you write 
um, can use to, for example, do things like, you know, kind of embedded debuggers that will dump data structures, uh, maybe in a real-time HUD overlay in a graphics application or something like that. Um, and so I think m most people nowadays understand the benefit of runtime introspection. Uh, it's very, very easy to add if you structure your compiler uh, for a clean, uh, with clean data structures for describing types and so on. You more or less just have to dump them out and make them available. So uh, we'll do that because it's basically free and it's hugely valuable. Um, as a side effect of, uh, of the compiler being, you know, kind of two pass and the language being simple to compile and so on, and also partly as a side effect of runtime introspection, we'll be able to do really good, powerful, fast, fast meaning, sorry, fast meaning stuff that executes quickly. It's not very, uh, it doesn't take a long time to execute on say 10,000 lines of code or whatever uh, tooling. And this includes, you know, maybe refactoring or code search or uh, instrumentation, um, various kinds of, you know, maybe export tools. You want to do a doc tool that generates a nicely formatted documentation page. All of these tools will be extremely easy to write. They will just almost be simple scripts because the compiler will expose the data in a form that's easily digestible and immediately uh, kind of obvious in what, what to do with it. Um, a final thing, going back to some of the packaging woes with C, is we'll, we'll have a very lightweight packaging approach. Uh, and it's very close to what Go does, um, at least that's my current plan. And it emphasizes convention over configuration, uh, and it relies heavily on the fact that declarations are order independent. Um, and the idea in case, well, let's talk about it afterwards uh, when, when we go into examples, but anyway. Uh, and, and so about the implementation, this is roughly what I plan to do. We're going to bootstrap the compiler as a C99 code base because C is the language we should, you know, we're going to use to get started. Um, and eventually, in some indeterminate future when it's appropriate, we will actually convert it to a self-hosting ion code base. And that will be very easy because of the isomorphism between the two languages. And once we've made it self-hosting, it means that the compiler itself can actually run on the target system. So originally the compiler can be used to cross compile to the target system, but because it's written in C and we don't have a C compiler, uh, unless we use third party tools, which we refuse to do, that's kind of the point, then it won't, it'll be able to compile programs that can run on the machine, but the compiler itself can't run on the machine. Um, but once it's self-hosting, we will just basically on the host, compile itself to the target, then deploy it on the target. And at that point you can do development directly on the target without a cross compilation workflow. So that's an eventual goal and the close similarity between C99 and ION semantically and so on um, is going to make that very easy once we decide to do it. Um, yeah, and, and another cool benefit is once we do self-hosting, um, there's, always, there's always an issue with bootstrapping self-hosting implementations. Um, but for us, because we have the C generating backend, we're just going to, in the source control repository, we're just going to distribute the generated C code as well as the original ION code for the ION compiler, which means that when you sync the repo from source, you just build a C program that gives you the first version of the compiler, then the compiler compiles itself, and now you're fully running from the ION code. Um, so uh, we'll talk more about bootstrapping much later, but um, th this has some real benefits in terms of making self-hosting not a, a pain in the ass. Uh, compiler structure, very simple, two pass, uh, pass one, Lexes does an L one parse and outputs an AST. Pass do does uh, it resolves uh, names. So it uh, pass one doesn't know whether a name refers to a variable or a type. Um, pass two first thing it does is it tries to resolve names. Um, then it types check type checks everything and then it generates code. And depending on the the back end, it'll be C code or Risk Five machine code. And quite often there will also be some metadata for things like um, you know, tooling that wants to to know what got compiled and stuff like that. Maybe warnings and other things that got output uh, that you want to represent in a structured format rather than just command line terminal output. Um, yeah, and I mentioned this random cool stuff. We can generate, for example, STB style libraries from a multi-file code base. So, you know, maybe you could argue that if we do a good job, we will actually be able to do better C libraries than C itself. But I mean, that's contentious. Let's see if that works out. So um, let's see how we're doing on time. Let me check. I think this stream will probably run over uh, compared to yesterday. This will probably be at least an hour and a half because we're already 40 minutes in.
So I thought I would just start writing some example code. I'm not going to give you a specification for now. Uh, in fact, I haven't written a true specification, but um, I'm going to give you just start writing some code, and you will, and I'll explain things as I go. So um, the first thing is that most keywords are exactly as you know them. Um, so in this case, I mean, you can. Okay, I can't type. You can declare an enum using exactly the C style syntax. One thing you'll note is that there are no uh, commas between items, and I'll get into the way new lines work in the syntax a little bit later, but that's uh, already, I think, something you can see. If you want to declare a struct, uh, it has the same syntax. Um, the way you declare values having certain types is more algol style. So you have the name of the variable followed by colon, and then followed by a type designator. And the type syntax is close to C. Um, you can judge for yourself. But so in this case, well, in this case, it's easy. We'll just say kind has type, expert kind. Uh, and then we'll declare two other fields left and right, which are going to be, oh, and this was a typo. These are going to be pointers to expressions. And so the type syntax is there is some sort of type name as a base, and then in postfix, left associative uh, kind of fashion, you build up the type uh, step by step. So you start with an expression type, you add the asterisk to, to designate a pointer type. If you wanted to have an, ar an array of pointers to expressions, you would do something like this. If it has an explicit size, it would look like this. Uh, if you would have a multidimensional array, it would look like this. So that's the idea. Um, so that's, it, unlike say Go's prefix oriented uh, sort of agglomeration syntax for types. This is more like C, it's postfix. Um, what else? Right, variables. Uh, variables are declared with var. Um, you can do type inference, uh, where if you do, um, if you don't specify a type with colon, but just write equals in an expression, it will, um, it will infer the type. So in this case, it will be float. Um, you can do a similar thing with const um, uh, like this, where it declares a, a, a true compile time constant. Um, uh, declaring functions are done with func. I mean, you should recognize these keywords from Swift and Go. They're, except for the, the old uh, C keywords, these are exactly what Go and Swift uses. Um, to declare a function, you would write, um, let's see, let's write a recursive Fibonacci function. So it would uh, it would look like this, and um, I mean the rest is exactly how you would write it in C. Did I write Fibonacci? Oh, I meant factorial. Um, so like this. Um, so in particular, if you've seen what Go does with round parentheses, removing them, and so on. Uh, we don't do that, and maybe I'll talk about that more later. But I, I pretty, it actually has a very important reason that has to do, for example, with um, the way new line insertion or the way semicolon and comma insertion works at new lines. But also personally, I find it actually easier to scan to explicitly bracket expressions like this. And in any case, it's like C, so we're not deviating from C just for the sake of it. Uh, you know, if you wanted to do the equivalent iterative version of this function, you would do something like this. Uh, you would have um, a result accumulator, and then you would have uh, a variable iterating from one through um, one through n, and you would do this, and then you would return it. Uh, one thing to note here. Oh, so so yeah, let's talk about this thing. You guys probably know this uh, type of declaration from. Let's see, everyone uses it nowadays. Well, I think certainly Go uses it. I think uh, Jonathan Jonathan Blows, Jai uses this notation. Sh Sean Barrett had an old language that also used this notation. It's kind of a it's kind of stealing a a, a symbol that used to be uh, used in Algol uh, and Pascal and so on for assignment and turning it into a combined declaration and assignment. So you actually could equivalently have written this as var uh, var r equals um, uint equals one. Um, 
and uh, you know, in, or something like that. Uh, and but but you know, most of the time when you have a right hand side to infer the type from, we're just going to do to to do this. Um, and you can see we also use it here in a standard three clause four loop to initialize the loop variable. Uh, and it's very syntactically brief. I mean, I don't have to. I don't think I have to argue for why this is a nice compact uh, notation. Um, another thing to note is that all assignment operators, uh, unlike C, uh, and like I would say most other languages designed after C, don't make uh, the various assignment forms like, you know, uh, r equals zero, r times equals zero. It doesn't make them uh, expressions. They're purely statements. So something like this can only be used in a statement context. You couldn't do something weird like uh, like this, for example. Like this would be illegal. Um, you have to use it in a statement context. Uh, and, and this actually pays dividends for some things later. Um, all right. So let's let's say we have a um, uh, we have a data type like a point with an x and a y coordinate, and then maybe we have a rect and um, it has both a position and a size, uh, and maybe we'll just call these a vector, actually. Um, so it has a position and a size, each of which is a vector. Um, if you wanted to, um, I type void there, that's a bad habit. Uh, if you wanted to uh, you know, make a constructor type thing for this, you might do, um, hmm, Let's say someone gives you uh, min vector and and you can actually just use commas. Let's say someone you want to convert from a uh, min max sort of you know uh, upper left corner lower right corner format to a position and size format. Um, you could do it something like this. Um, you have this compound literal notation, and we have basically two options. Um, and let's maybe write it on the first line or on the same line for the first one. Uh, you could just do, let's see, um, let's say, you know, the, the position is just min. Um, and then for the size, we would have, you know, max x minus min x, uh, max i minus min y, something like that. Um, oh, and no semicolon, of course. Uh, so you have this kind of standard, you know, like this is a, basically the C99 compound literal syntax for constructing aggregates uh, in an R value context, not just an initialization context. Um, but uh, as a nice side effect, well, using designated initializers, you can also do something like this. You can, especially when you have a bunch of fields to initialize, um, it would probably be a better idea to rather than rely on the order of the fields to specify explicit names. And we can use the syntax, and I uh, actually, you don't even, uh, you know, you don't even need, um, for reasons I maybe talk about in a bit, you don't even need the, the new lines afterwards if you don't want them. Um, but I think in this case, it's probably advisable. But yeah, you can specify uh, names and because uh, Assignment, assignments aren't expressions. When you see some name equals, it's totally unambiguous. In C99, you have to do dot pose to do the equivalent. Uh, we won't need to do that sort of thing. It's a small benefit. It's a sort of a nice side effect of not having assignment exp uh, expressions. But you know, you might as well save a character uh, and make it look a little bit nicer. Um, let's see, max x. Okay, I think that's. Um, what was the next thing? I just wanted to, to jog my brain about what to cover. We're not going to cover all the language. I just want to give a little bit of a taste. It's going to look almost exactly like C. That's kind of the point, but cleaned up. One thing I want to talk about, I guess, is the president's table. Um, so um, this is basically the Go, I think exactly the Go president's table. Uh, there's five levels of presidents. Um, um, Let's say highest to highest to lowest, um, and um, and I will sort of call them by names. I'll call the highest one mul for multiply, and I'm going to fill in what care, what what operators are associated with it. Then there's add. Then there's comparison, which is like equals to less than or equal to, and so on. Um, then there's and, and there's or. So this highest uh, precedence level includes. Uh, multiplication, division, uh, modulo, 
uh, left shift, right shift. Um, let me think, is there anything else? Maybe that's it. Uh, add includes uh, plus and minus, of course, but it also, oh, and it includes, very importantly, going back to the precedence issue with bitwise operators in C, it includes um, bitwise and. And then for the add class, that's right below it, plus, minus, uh, or, so kind of, so that these two have the right, you know, sum of products, relative precedence, um, and also the right precedence relative to comp. Um, what am I missing here? I'm just going to use dot, 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 but you get the idea. Comp is, you know, these guys, and is this, and or is this. So these are logical and and logical or. And so this is, I think, exactly the Go precedence table. If you think through it, it's it really simplifies things. It actually is a model that you can carry in your head and understand rather than have to look up uh, online or whatever when you're confused, because you know the the one precedence that almost everyone knows and, and exploits is the fact that sum of products can be written without parentheses. So you you can write this, and that's totally unambiguous because that's kind of what everyone I think knows. You don't have to parenthesize this. You can just rely on uh, multiplication binding tighter than addition. And so using that as kind of an organizational principle for even things that are not technically quite of that type um, really simplifies it. Um, and by having, so to, to refer to this, refer back to this issue with bitwise and an or and C, um, because and an or, bitwise and an or are lower precedence than comparisons, uh, something like this actually has the right meaning. Um, so this means if, you know, it means something like this. Um, and uh, that really clarifies that. And then, you know, going down and and or, uh, logical logical and and or are basically like sum and product. I mean, actually they are sum, they are product and sum respectively, uh, but with respect to a higher level of, or a lower level of precedence so that you can write stuff like, you know, you know, you, you can write uh, this. And uh, I mean, like I'm telling you obvious stuff, but that's the reason those are lower precedence. Um, and this is stuff that's familiar. Now, the fact that the precedence table has been simplified doesn't mean you shouldn't add extra technically redundant parentheses for clarity. You absolutely should. Like you have to exercise um, kind of taste in that re regard. But the fact that you at least don't have to worry about gotchas, I think, is a major source of simplification. So uh, this is basically the, the Go table. I had my own earlier version before I looked at exactly what Go does, and then theirs was slightly better, and I just decided to copy it verbatim because I think this is pretty close to the canonical best version. Uh, Swift has, I think, almost the same table. They have some additional levels above these, but basically the same table. Um, okay, how are we doing on time? Okay, actually, I think I'll finish in 10 minutes. That's an hour, and then we'll do Q&A. So maybe we'll do 30 minutes of Q&A afterwards. So in 10 minutes. Um, let's see, going back to... Um, dum, dum, dum. Maybe say something about packages for people. It's almost a Go packaging model, but with less namespacing and uh, ideology about namespacing. Um, so... The way translation units effectively work is that um, all ion files in a directory um, except, except for special kinds of, of, of names uh, are considered part of the same translation unit um, automatically. And so if you have um, a.ion, b.ion, c.ion, and someone does import foo, this refers to the agglomeration of the source code of a.ion, b.ion, and c.ion. And one really nice feature of this is that you can, re you can organize stuff in files however you want. If you're someone who is you know, perfectly happy to have 10,000 line files, you can put it in one file and the system doesn't penalize you. If you want to split it into a bunch of 50 line files because that's your thing, 
you can just take sections of code, paste them into new files. You literally don't have to do anything else. There's not even a package declaration. You just put them into these different files in the same directory. And because declarations are order independent, when you do that, you can't screw up the meaning uh, or the ordering because of four declarations or whatever. So you can organize code however you want. You can have one mega file. You can have many files. You can move back and forth. You can take chunks of code and copy and paste them around in the same file for uh, organizational purposes. But basically, it's not trying to impose an ideology about sort of only, so only certain, like there is a way to control visibility of names, but by default, packages are not really about namespacing per se. They're a little bit about it, but primarily they're about being able to organize the code and reorganize your code without the uh, tedium and just like pain in the assness of, 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 of dealing with four declarations and other things of that sort, you know, and also having to maintain a, f a list of files that go into the package. Uh, one, one, yeah, so on that note, one really nice thing about this is suppose you do, you know, a text editor extension to be able to do, you know, an IntelliSense and code navigation and stuff. If you have a certain file in a certain package directory open, it's implicit that the other ion files in the directory constitute part of the same translation unit for the sake of resolving local references. And hence, you don't have to tell your text editor about, you know, your build system or however you specify the list of files that go into a package, it will just do a, an LS in the local directory, find the ion files, concatenate them in, in, in a random order, at least if the compiler is correct, the order you concatenate them in should not matter, and it will do the right thing. It will be able to you know, go, go do dump to definition across different files and so on without knowing any kind of workspace metadata. So this is what I meant earlier about con convention over configuration. Rather than configuring this stuff, we're just going to have a strong convention. Um, you, you know, and in terms of package granularity, uh, it's true that if you want to have different sub packages that are, you know, namespaced separately, you need a directory for each of them. But if you're just like a C programmer who likes having, like I said, one, one mega package for your whole program with 10,000, maybe some files are mega huge, 10,000 lines, others are small. There's really no penalty or opinion from the language. This is just a way for you to easily refactor stuff and not have to tell the uh, either the compiler or whatever IDEs you're using or other tools where to find the code and what, what code to group together. So hopefully people who are kind of nervous about overwrought, um, very opinionated uh, package, package systems will hopefully find that um, uh, easing their, their concerns. But I'm happy once we get to the Q&A in a few minutes, I'm happy to answer questions on that. Um, but I think that's a pretty big win actually. Um, it's a, it's like I said, it's very similar to how Go handles packages, but Go has much stronger focus on controlling namespaces and sort of very large scale development where you want to be fairly um, strict about segregating namespaces because you're using different libraries that don't know about each other and, and you don't want them to pick up wrong versions of things or have uh, unnecessary name collisions. For us, we'll be much more just providing a mechanism rather than imposing a policy about how to do stuff. So. Uh, um, that's, that's packaging. Um, so that's pretty much what I wanted to cover, I think, in terms of just giving the overview, motivating the decisions and running through some example code. Um, so I think I'll open up the floor to questions if anyone has questions. So I'm reading chat now. So please, I'll go back and look back, um, to earlier questions, but please use the at sign with my name in the chat if you want me to see the messages now. Sorry, I, audio didn't stop working. I'm just uh, catching up on text. I'm, I see a lot of good comments, but I, I want to, I'm only going to respond to sort of direct questions. Um, 
someone was asking, someone was saying earlier that they really wanted default variable declarations to be immutable, kind of like Go. Again, that's one of those opinionated things. Like, I'm like a huge functional programming nerd, um, but I don't think that's appropriate for a C-like language. That's one of those things where, regardless of what you think in a broader context, in the context of what we're doing, sticking to C-style conventions about mutability versus immutability is the right call. Uh, someone's asking about using C99 to bootstrap the compiler. The big reason is just that C11 is rarely, uh, is unevenly supported on MSVC. And, I, and in fact, uh, C99 support is still not complete, even in the latest version. Um, Visual Studio 2015 finally got pretty good C99 support, like designated initializers and compound literals. But C99 is pretty much the only thing that a recent compiler on all platforms will will be able to make sense of. Um, so someone saying that um, because unlike having you know a var or a let prefix before variable declarations and local variable declarations and functions, when you use the colon equals auto declaration, um, you don't know what you're parsing until you see it. Trust me, I have a, I have a simple LL1 factoring of the grammar that only factors out one piece of the expression grammar into the statement grammar to accomplish it. So it's a very small, can be it's a very small, like five line change to the parser, um, even if it cro even if it mixes one production from expressions, uh, which is namely variable references with uh, some statement stuff about these auto declarations. But anyway, trust me, I've actually worked out the LL1 grammar for this stuff. So uh, the syntax is actually LL1. You'll have to trust me uh, until we get to the actual grammar and maybe next stream. Um, Someone's asking about bit fields. That's actually the one thing I was planning on leaving out, at least in the beginning, because it's so rare that you have to use it for interoperability. And as an actual feature, it's close to, has close to zero value. Um, Someone's asking random, or not random, someone's asking parsing questions. You're just going to have to trust me uh, for now. And once we cover how to design LL1 grammars, how to write LL1 recursive descent parsers, hopefully everything will become clear if it isn't already. But yeah, one of the things that took a while to figure out was how to factor the grammar in a way that makes everything LL1, because it doesn't happen for free. You have to really think through the different cases. And I've, I've, I've done that. Um, all right, um, tuples, yeah, no tuples because again, C-like, not trying to introduce higher levels of abstraction or stuff like that. Someone's asking about parametric polymorphism. The answer is absolutely no, no generics, no templates, uh, no parametric polymorphism. Um, again, you know, I would, I would almost have been happy to write a C compiler except for the complexity and the, the, the cruftiness. Um, so I'm, I'm really not trying to deviate from C. That doesn't mean that I think C is perfect. I'm, I, I, I mean, I have opinions on that stuff, but it's not really the right place for this when we're designing a language for teaching. But a, a language that's practical to use, but also very teachable to implement. Oh, someone's asking about LL1. Yeah, I'll go through all that theory. Uh, this is just for people who know what LL1 means. It has to do with being able to parse, uh, to parse things uh, using only one token of look ahead when you're doing a left to right predictive parse, but we'll go into that in the next stream. Uh, is var required in a declaration when specifying the type? Uh, yes, it is. Um, I played around with, with not specifying it and I felt it was not signposted well enough. Most of the time you'll be using co colon equals uh, anyway for local variables. Uh, I'm, am I interested in code formatters like Go format? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, I didn't want to just maybe spring it on everyone, but I plan to have canonical formatting for all code, completely canonical formatting, um, so that you know, can, yeah, canonical format what it says on the tin.
Um, did I talk about why I chose to C to build the language? Part of it is because I want the compiler to run fast and I don't want to assume I mean, you know, I could write it in Rust, even though I'm, I'm not that experienced. I could write it in a functional language, but honestly, for the style of parser we'll be writing, you don't have a lot of leverage from higher level languages and C is what I'm kind of assuming people know. So it seems uh, appropriate. Is the compiler itself, will the compiler be a standalone program? That is, will opening a file be handled as an assembly system call? Uh, uh, no, there, there will be dependencies um, on the, system libraries, but they will be abstracted away as much as possible. You'll have the ability to use Win32 or libc directly if you want to, but there will be a um, a core library that's abstracted from that stuff so that we don't have to implement libc semantics and, and APIs on our target platform, but still be able to have basic file IO and stuff like that. Uh, do I plan? How do I plan to handle errors? Special return values like C? No. So again, I'm not trying to create new abstractions or conventions that C doesn't really have. Um, so unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, there won't be any kind of new philosophy on how to do error handling. It'll be old school Unix and uh, C. Um, someone's saying, I'm a recent graduate who's learning a lot in a new embedded job. Will I have trouble trying to keep up and follow the development of this and understand it? Is it aimed towards seasoned professionals? It's not aimed towards seasoned professionals um, at all. Uh, I, I mean, I basically assume that people are have some systems programming sort of know-how, even if they're not technically professionals. I assume that, they, that they're smart and can learn things fast. Um, I assume that they know C fluently. I think if you have those prerequisites, you should at least try to follow along. And if it becomes totally overwhelming, maybe you can reevaluate. But I think your background sounds like a perfect fit for what we're doing and what I'm aiming for level-wise. Um, someone's asking about recommendations for particular books. In the next stream, I'll actually be referencing a bunch of books because I'll have to abbreviate certain certain explanations in order to keep things tight for the stream. But uh, ne next stream, I'll, I'll give you all detailed references that you can go and look at in your uh, spare time. Um, how much do you think you'll have done on the next stream? I don't know. We'll probably have, I think we could finish, no, I, I mean, the next stream, it depends on how much coding I do after I, so I actually don't want to do coding from when I shut down the stream until tomorrow, I want to start the parser on stream, uh, which we'll be writing the parser and lecture tomorrow. If we if we code for a few hours, we can probably write most of the lecture and maybe well all of the lecture and maybe a, a good chunk of the parser. Um, but then I will continue writing the parser off stream, and then the following day. Uh, hopefully just extending the same ideas about how to write the parser as I already showed on stream. I think the parser will be done. So the parser should be done. We'll start it tomorrow and hopefully the next stream, the first version of the parser will be done and I will do a code review walkthrough and explain anything that isn't obvious. Um, just catching up. Multiple return values, no. Kind of like the question about tuples. Um, I'm really not trying to invent conventions that are not canonically and idiomatically representable in C. Um, I've thought about doing some kind of struct unpacking. Um, that would be pretty idiomatically translatable to C, but again, I got just erred on the side of minimalism when it came to that stuff, regardless of how useful it would be. Oh, someone's asking about default values. Actually, I plan to make everything zero initialized, um, like full stop. There's no way to have undef undefined uh, you know, uninitialized uh, local variables. And so if you want to have large structures or arrays on the stack, uh, you should use something like alloc A. Like, so stuff you put on the stack, you should be comfortable uh, being zero initialized before being filled in. Um, no null type in the language, right? No, there's definitely null because it's C. I mean, it's essentially the C machine model. So there's void, there's void star. Uh, yeah, there's there's void and there's void star. All, all of the C style stuff is there in the type system because it has to be for for the isomorphism to work out. Uh, white space sensitive? No, there's no white space sensitivity. Um, 
the one, so, so I'll go over it next stream, but basically the convention for uh, synthesizing semicolons and commas is that every single line, except line endings, every, sorry, every single new line, except for new lines that are within parentheses results in a new line token. And then the grammar, instead of just matching a literal semicolon, for example, is going to match, you know, either a semicolon or a new line or a semicolon followed by a new line. Those all constitute a terminator or a separator. Um, and so the only real lexical convention along those lines is that uh, inside nested parentheses, new lines don't result in the assertion of uh, new line tokens, basically. Um, let's see. Yes, someone's asked, asking if I'm using the Go Lexer hack. I'm actually not. The way I'm doing new line insertion is much more like how Python does it rather than Go. Go's convention is essentially to look at the last token before the new line. And if it's one of a set of things that are considered line terminators, then it does new line insertion. My, my, my approach is much more you know, context independent in terms of, you know, it doesn't depend on what exact token you put at the end of the line, but it does depend on whether you're inside a parenthesis. And as a result, just like the Python lexer, you have to do parenthesis counting in the lexer, but that's literally just a matter of adding a number and subtracting a number when you see an open paren and a closed paren. So um, I think that's a good engineering trade-off. Someone's asking about go to, uh, to be determined, I, I will try to leave out go to in the beginning. Maybe we will do labeled uh, labeled break and continue for breaking out of nested loops, and we will translate those to go to's on the C side. But for now, I'm just going to leave them out because I don't think they're all that necessary and they're easy to add later. Uh, var args, there's some, yeah, I should, there's a, maybe a longer story about var args. There has to be support for untyped C style var args just for interoperability. So you can use printf and, and other library functions. Uh, well, printf, you could re-implement yourself, but uh, if you're using a library that has a var args uh, ABI, you need to be able to use it. Uh, there's the question of whether there will be a better way of doing var args in it, within the language itself. And one option is to use runtime introspection for dispatch uh, where rather than just passing a pointer to a value that you don't know this type of, and you have to infer it from a format code in a printf string, for example, it actually, the, the compiler will insert a, a companion argument, which is a type descriptor, and it will bundle those up in a struct containing a pointer, a raw pointer, void pointer to the thing, to the piece of data, and a type descriptor. And on the C side, that will you know, turn into like just passing a struct and uh, plopping in the, uh, the type descriptor at you know in a, in a way that's the, the the deduction of what type descriptor to use is deducible at compile time but the function that's called with an argument that contains a type descriptor can dispatch at runtime on the kind of type descriptor so i think stuff like that will be easy to do just as a side effect of the introspection uh, and you can use that for certain kinds of type safe variadic processing but we will definitely also have a uh, sort of unsafe untyped uh, c style var args but uh, anyway Switch, yeah, switch is same as C. I didn't cover every control flow, but I actually even have do while. And the reason is do while is not hard to implement and it gives parity with C. And even though it's not very useful compared to the other control flow structures, uh, let's just put it in there because it's C, right? It has like almost zero cost to put in. Um, will heavy math around algorithm complexity be introduced? Uh, no, I mean, I kind of assume people have a basic understanding of complexity analysis. Um, so I'll, I'll mention it along the way, but it won't be a topic. Um, let's see here. All right. Someone's asking about, you know, why wouldn't I just, why wouldn't I just implement this myself rather than watching uh, pair and I mean me uh, code. Well, the answer is um, I, maybe I should talk about this tomorrow in more structured way since we start coding then. Um, I think there's a couple of ways to follow along. One is to just passively watch me code. The other is to re-implement stuff I'm doing yourself. Essentially, I mean, you can type it yourself in real time or after the fact or however you prefer. You can implement pieces of it, not all of it, you know, whatever, whatever you feels appropriate for your learning style. But 
there will also be a bunch of just exercises. So for example, for tomorrow, I will probably give you guys a take home exercise about writing an expression parser that acts as a little calculator or something like that. And maybe after that, I'll ask you to extend it to support arbitrary user-defined operators with arbitrary precedence and associativity just to make sure you understand operator precedence parsing. So there'll be a bunch of exercises like that uh, that will spin off from what I'm showing on stream. So it won't just be passive watching uh, if you're doing it correctly, I would say. But I mean, if you just want to uh, watch me uh, hammer on the keyboard, you're welcome to do so as well. All right. Uh, how do I pronounce your name? Uh, uh, just say Per Vonsen, Per Vonsen, which is normally what Americans say, and I'm perfectly fine with that pronunciation. Uh, will the compiler be able to resolve loops at compile time? No, there's no, uh, there's no compile time execution of code like there might be in Lisp, where you have a separate, you know, any code can run there. I think John is also doing that in Jai. But again, I'm not trying to make, you know, the most powerful language ever, the best language ever with all my favorite ideas. I'm really trying to keep it very close to C. Um, so yeah, ho hopefully my, hopefully those constraints make sense to you why I'm choosing to do things the way I am. There's obviously some arbitrary choices that are based on my personal biases, but I really try to make everything driven, be driven by the constraints rather than me coming along with all my favorite language design quirks and just kind of imposing them on you guys, which I think would be uh, a huge mistake. So I'm really trying to not to do that. Um, someone's asking about type inference. There's actually one type of type inference. Yeah, maybe I'll show that quickly. Um, so in C, if you do, so this is C code, uh, in C, if you have like a, uh, well, an array, for example, uh, you can do this. I mean, maybe this is a bad example. Say, say it's actually a vector from, from earlier and you have an X and a Y coordinate. Um, you can do this. And because it's an initialization, you don't have to, I mean, you, you could do this even before C99, but I mean, you could also use this syntax uh, here. But effectively, this vector part is inferred in classic C. That's a weird way of looking at it, but it's one way of looking at it. Um, but in a normal expression context in C99, you have compound literals. So if I'm calling a function like make vect in C, you can do, you know, I guess you would do rect, um, and then you can do, what is it? Um, Sorry, I guess it would be for make rect, it would be vector uh, AB and then, or sorry, now I'm mixing up the two languages. It would be something like this for the, um, for, the, for, for the compound literals in an expression context. So one thing that we'll do, uh, because it's free and it makes for more concise code with less stuttering is when you call a function, you actually know the parameter values. So when you're evaluating, when you're parsing, you're type resolving the argument, not parsing. When you're type resolving uh, the argument expressions, you already know that this has to be a vector. And so if you see an untyped aggregate initializer or literal aggregate literal, you know it's, it refers to a vector. So you'll be able to do stuff like this. One of the nice things about this is it reduces the syntactic tax of passing things as for example, separate X and Y coordinates as parameters versus a struct containing X and Y coordinates. Because with this notation, there's only two characters of overhead. You don't have to type out the full name of the type every time you want to pass a struct literal, for example. Um, and this is a universal uh, feature. Anytime there's an explicit type that can be inferred from the context, you can leave out the thing. So for example, if you do, um, if you do this, you know, you probably wouldn't normally use the syntax, except maybe in a, uh, in, a global, in a in a uh, in a global, because locally you would normally you would normally do this instead. But if you do this, um, let's see here. If you do this, uh, this thing up here, the fact that it knows that uh, the thing you're assigning to is a rect means that it knows what type to interpret this. In. And this ends up having the same effect as old school C89 uh, aggregate initializers, basically. But it's not a special initialization thing. It's just a side effect of knowing the type in a context. 
Um, and this also works, I mean, this is also how other things work, like what was the thing we were looking at? Yeah, so look at this. How do we know that this inner uh, initializer refers to a vector? So it has two fields, it has a, a minute, it has a, a post and a size vector field. How do we know this first argument? What, what, you know, in other words, why don't, why, don't I, why don't I have to write this? Which is super verbose. Well, the answer is because in the context of rect, it knows this whole thing has to be a rect. And when it knows that whole thing has to be a rect, it knows the first field has to be a vector. And so all these types are just uh, easily inferred from the context. And you can obviously, like if you have a function with a ton of arguments and you all, and you provide all the arguments with this kind of anonymous literal syntax, it could get unreadable. So you'll have to exercise um, some taste in how widely to use this, but it's basically favoring uh, the reduction of redundancy and brevity um, and, and, and leaving some matters of, of style to the programmer to decide about whether they want to be more explicit or, or less. But anyway, so yeah, that's something I didn't talk about. So that's that's the closest thing to type inference we have aside from the standard auto declarations. Um, well, modules allow private, i.e. non-exported function. Yes, I mean, I, I, there's going to be namespacing, but I guess the point I want to make is that packages won't be primarily a namespace mechanism. They will be a useful way to do that too, but they're primarily an organizational unit rather than a namespace unit. So if you want to do everything with all your symbols public because you're just prototyping and you're not trying to really nail down the, the public interface, there's no kind of language imposed ideology about you should always design the interface first. So you should only ever expose explicit uh, symbols. Uh, you know, there's nothing like that. You're free to just have everything be public and then nail it down afterwards, which I think is the right approach for iterative development. Uh, and also for the kind of, you know, like Go has specific reasons why they're very strict about namespacing, like I mentioned earlier, and they won't necessarily apply to us. Um, could the restraint statement on line 47 be simplified? Yes, it could. That's a very good catch. That's exactly a side effect of the type inference I mentioned. Um, all right. I have to uh, plug in my computer now. Uh, or sorry, my power supply, which may add some ground loop hum. So uh, if I disconnect from the stream temporarily, uh, that will be the problem. So, uh, you know, let's, let's try, see if it disconnects like it did yesterday. All right, we managed to survive, it looks like. So, uh, so yeah, I think we're winding down. We're already close to one and a half hours, which is probably about right. Um, so next steps, uh, tomorrow we'll start writing the Lexer and the parser. And as part of that, we'll also cover how to do Lexing and how to do parsing uh, in a very simple way. And uh, it will be pretty brief in terms of the theory, but I'll provide very succinct, readable, freely available references uh, by the master of simple compilers. So you'll, you guys are in for a treat for reading that additional material, I think. So I'll provide all that tomorrow in the context of the explanation. So um, I think I'll, I'll, stop, uh, I'll, I'll stop recording now for the official video and uh, I'll stick around on the stream for a while longer, just hanging out and chatting. So uh, thanks for watching and see you tomorrow, hopefully.